DeRay, what's good? It's good to be here. I appreciate the invite. Yeah, welcome to Vlad TV. <laughs> and you got the, the Patagonia, which is like your thing. You know, I wear, I, I wear the same thing every day, it feels like. Really? I do. Okay. Well, that's like your uniform. Is it? <laughs> it is very much like my uniform. It makes getting up much easier. Absolutely. Who, who else does that? Uh, the Facebook guy. Um, Mark Zuckerberg. Mark Zuckerberg, yeah. right. He wears the same thing every day because he doesn't want to waste his thought on dressing. He wants it's very to, simple. Wants it's to like focus a, all on Facebook. So Like same shoes, same pants, almost, same vest. There you go. So you're really known as a, as a protester and an activist. But how did you really get into that role? Yeah, so I saw what was happening in Ferguson on Twitter, um, like so many other people last August. And I was on my couch, it was one o'clock in the morning, and I saw it and I was like, I wanna go. I wanna go just see what's happening. So I literally, like, I waited till eight o'clock in the morning. I called one of my friends, I was like, I think I'm gonna go. I lived in Minneapolis at the time. I was a senior director of human capital um, for the school system. And I like literally got in the car at eight o'clock, drove down to St. Louis, and I ended up there. I put on Facebook, I'm going. Um, hoping that I had like a friend or somebody who I could like sleep on their couch or something. Seven hours in, they were like, Teray, you can sleep. I had like a friend of a friend called and was like, you can sleep here. Um, and I became somebody who was down there. I wouldn't even call myself a protest on those first day. On the first day, I was just trying to see what was going on. Um, and the second day that I was there, I think was the first day of the curfew. It was like a midnight curfew. And we got tear gas around eight o'clock. And I'll never forget getting tear gas for the first time. And in that moment, I became a protester. Like I became somebody who was like, I'm gonna do whatever I can to make sure this is not the, the reality for, for people. Okay. Like, I mean, I've never been tear gassed before. Like how, how bad is it? Yeah, you know, I'm, I'm, when this question comes up, I'm mindful that like I, I talk about it because it happened, not because it was like a joyful thing or something I want to relive or it was like an exciting experience. I mean, and I'm also reminded that people have been tear gassed very recently in places like St. Louis and, and other cities. Um, but if anything, it, it, there's like a strong menthol sort of feel across your face, right? So when you stand still, it sort of, you know, stings a little bit, but when you move, like when the wind hits it, when something hits your face, it like really stings. Um, and it like, you know, gets in your eyes. It attaches itself to your clothes and your body in a way that the other chemicals don't. Like pepper balls, for instance, make you sneeze and they make your eyes water, but they don't necessarily get on your clothes. But tear gas sort of gets in your clothes and stuff, which makes it even worse. I mean, Ferguson seemed to be sort of like a turning point in, in, in um, sort of the, the activism and protest story. Because it seems like all this stuff was happening that led up to Ferguson and it would happen and there'd be like this injustice kind of outcome to it and people would just sort of take it and just move on. Whereas Ferguson, it seemed like people just finally got sick of it all. But what do you think made Ferguson sort of special in that regard? Yeah, you know, I'm sensitive to the fact that we didn't discover injustice in August and we didn't yeah. invent resistance, right? That like we, we exist in a legacy and tradition of protest. Um, I think what made it different was that, you know, I don't think the, the people in the early days weren't, didn't come out to fight the police, right? They came out to mourn and the police came to fight the protesters, uh, which, which is an important sort of thing to note. And also that like social media just allowed people to organize differently. So like not only were there tons of people in the street, but we could organize and come together and sort of understand what was happening and sort of push back on these dominant culture narratives and the media in ways that people just didn't have the tools to do before. We could take the vines and the videos and we could say this just happened, take a picture of it. And and it could, we could amplify that message in a way that, you know, you think about the civil rights movement, they had to, um, you know, some of their strategy was protest during the day so that the video reel could get back to the station at night so it could be on TV. But with us, everything was happening in real time in a way that was just so different. And we could say to people, like, this is happening right here. Like, we are getting tear gassed because the police are killing people. Sure. Well, I mean, you could even take it back to, like, the Emmett Till uh, situation where I remember reading about how his mother insisted on an open casket yeah. so the media can come and take pictures. And I, I don't know if there was video back then or not, or I don't know how widespread it was, but, but to take photos and to get that message out there to see what, what was happening. Yeah, it just wasn't instant in those days, right? No, not at all. Um, and all of a sudden it is instant. So like when the police do something, it's like, you know, it is, it, we can make things go viral in a way that that, that, con uh, that concept was just so different, you know, 50 years ago. Yeah, I, I mean, I talk about this a lot, you know, with, with various guests that I have on, on Vlad TV, but for example, my theory is that things are, are no worse and no, or no better than they were for the last 20, 30 years. It's just that you have the social media, you have the instant uh, 
you know, way to actually get that information out there. Before, it was very siphoned into just a few major media outlets. If CNN decided that, that this wasn't worth covering, then it would just literally get no coverage. There might be a local, you know, news station out there that might cover it, and then it would just live and die within a couple of days. Whereas these days, you sort of have a different type of thing. But do you feel that things are worse now or about the same? I think that we've been telling the truth about the trauma in neighborhoods my entire lives, right? Especially the violence of the police. I think that, like you said, the only thing that's different now is that the way we tell the truth has changed, right? So we can tell the truth in social media spaces, um, which allow us to amplify those messages in ways that people just literally did not have access to before. And that's the only thing that's different. He tried as much as he could, but he couldn't make it but we pretty much knew that it was a slim chance that he was gonna make it in the short time that we made this project. So we just kept moving and it's us four on there. A heterosexual man doesn't mind planting seeds of being gay in your mind of himself just in order to propel himself with popularity and money. Do you know who does this? In this society. Do you know who else does this? Who? Daylight. Ah. <laughs>